It is my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker this morning. As educators, we know that many of our students come to us with tremendous challenges that impact their well-being and their ability to learn. As principal of Lincoln High School in Walla Walla, Washington, Jim Spore Leader is credited with helping change the culture of the, that alternative school. Lincoln has gained national attention as a trauma-informed school. Under Spore Leader's leadership, Lincoln built its framework around caring adult relationships with specific strategies on how to work with students who live with toxic stress from poverty, substance abuse, physical abuse, and neglect. During the first year of implementation of its trauma-informed approach, Lincoln experienced an 85% reduction in out-of-school suspension days. After three decades as a teacher and leader, Spore Leader now works as a consultant. Director Jamie Redford filmed a documentary on Lincoln High School called Paper Tigers during the 2012-2013 school year. This was released recently at the Seattle International Film Festival. This documentary will be screened during an afternoon breakout session and Jim will be on hand to answer questions about the film and his experiences. Please join me in welcoming Jim Sporleader. I've, wa I've walked in your shoes. I, I, I know the pressure that, that keeps coming down, and so I admire the, the uh, job that you do and, and the cultures that you set to help kids. Um, I just screened about four months ago in our community, Walla Walla. They like the name so well they named it twice, but um, I, I did a documentary for or community event for uh, Rich Hill, and I'm telling you, it took me three days to recover from that powerful, powerful documentary of kids living in poverty. Need to get my mug, there we go. You know, I don't, I don't get a lot of opportunities to talk to a lot of groups and be able to stay connected. My travel keeps me moving. But if we could capture the hearts of many of you that are here that would be willing to look at making a new approach to school discipline, you will get everything that the mandates are asking from us. You'll get higher attendance, higher GPA, higher graduation rates, lower discipline, better attendance. And this model uh, will do that for you. So we need a new approach. And as you're, you're aware of the studies that are going around, but traditional discipline no longer works. Now we, we can think it works, but if you look at the research, we're, we're not the same uh, societal makeup that we were in the past. We don't have a lot of two-parent families uh, we have a lot of children without supervision. And so I, th I really think we need to come to grips with that. And I say that because I was very traditional uh, in my disciplinary approach. And so when I made my paradigm shift, which, which I'll get into it with you, but um, we really need to look at how we're disciplining kids. Because if we're gonna do it, it's going to be you and I that are going to be out there making the, being the change makers. Also, I'd like to just preference that going with a trauma-informed model is not adding onto your plate. It's not adding a curriculum because there is no curriculum. It's, it's how we approach our kids and families. Uh, I, uh, I'm terrible with names. Just shared with me her home her homeschool program of going out and doing the home visits. That's so powerful. And that's what we had at Lincoln. We had an intervention specialist, and I loved what she said. She goes, my relationships began on their porch. And so uh, they play an important role. 
You know, I was, I had all the zero tolerance policies hung up all around my middle school when I was there. And uh, all the anti-language, I had it down very well. But when we look at zero tolerance policies over the last 20 years, there is nothing, there's no research, there's nothing that tells us they're making our schools a safer place. But what they have done is they, they've taken suspensions to a whole different level. I was on the west side of our state uh, and went talking to a group. Uh, it was one of those groups I, I, I didn't know I was going into a lion's den until I got there. But our excessive discipline policies are hurting our kids and they're taking away from what you want from your kids the success that you're looking for your kids. And that's what we want to keep in, in, in place. And we know if we start suspending kids, the younger we start suspending them, it's a slippery slope to pipeline the prison. And what I love about the, the, the uh, trauma model, it is a model that treats everybody the same. There's no racial barrier. There's no economic barrier. Everybody gets treated the same, with dignity and respect. And when kids know that they have that trust in you as an adult, you can walk them miles and have that influence. I love this slide. I don't like the results of it, but it really kind of symbolizes what we do with discipline. I had a hammer. So they come into our office, so what do we do? We hit them with our hammer of traditional consequences and discipline. And if they return to our office, we hit them harder because they, they really need to get this. And so when that hammer is in our hand and that kid's a nail, we keep pounding it and pounding it and pounding it until we have a bent up nail that's not usable, what happens? We yank the, na the nail out and we toss it. And that's where we're losing kids out of the system through dropout. Just going to cover quickly on the ACE study. Um, if you look at the bottom, uh, this is the longest longitudinal study in America, still going on today. Uh, follows them all the way through death, 17,300 people. But if you just look at the pyramid alone, uh, when they first came out with a pyramid, they, they would have uh, circles that would go up and say, well, we think so, but we're not sure. Well, you don't see that now. They, if we've got kids building those adverse child experiences and we keep stacking on them, then it starts to get into their neural development and that's where the risk of behavior start. And up to six aces takes 20 years off your life expectancy. My last year at Lincoln, our kids were at 5.5 average. So if I told you that and said, There's, there it is, you can leave now, uh, I'd be giving you a story of hopelessness. But the research also gives us a pathway of hope and that's through the change of our approach. Dr. Anda calls it the number one chronic epidemic in the United States. And he says with the material and the research we have right now, it has, you have to consciously deny the research not to do anything. Well, in my state, our legislators are consciously not doing anything with the research. But look at the date, 2010 is when he said that in front of Congress at a Senate ha hearing, and, and we're, we're still talking about it. By a show of hands, how many got to pick the family they were born into? I'm a preacher's kid, I didn't get to predict that. Well, if you look at the, at the norms that we're using to evaluate our kids, we're still in that middle class norm, 
cause and effect. You do this, this is gonna happen. This happens, you're gonna be suspended. If we stay, we cannot, this is the traditional model that we have to come and look at and see where the changes need being made because we don't know what's behind the scene. We don't know what's behind the, the discipline. There's a story behind every discipline. And our kids are actually coming into schools with families that, like this. But we look at their behavior and we, we don't always look for the story. Now this would be wonderful if it, if it was possible to have a common belief for all of our kids to be successful in our schools, to attend school daily. My intervention specialist, if you were in school, she went out and knocked on your door and said, van's out front, you're going to school, let's go. Now they weren't always happy about that but it was a way of saying, we care so much about you. If I gotta come out to your door to pick you up and get you in school, I'm gonna do it. So expect me here every time you miss school, I'm gonna be out here because your success lies on you being in school, getting your education and being a part of the Lincoln family. So we want our kids focused on the academics, we want them motivated and engaged, we want them to behave appropriately, hand in their homework, and uh, do well in every one of their classes. Wouldn't we all want that? I mean, that, that, that's something that I think we would all want to strive for. But the reality is that, you know, this is state of Washington figures, yours could be higher, or a, lo a little bit lower, but what happens is, 50% of the kids coming into our classrooms have our trauma impacted. 50%. That's why we're seeing all these blowouts in our classrooms with disruptive behavior, and I'll get into that. This young man, we would probably reprimand and have him sent to the office immediately for non-compliance because his head's down, whereas there could have been a drug raid at his home in the middle of the night, or he got kicked out of the house and he was couch surfing. You know, we need to find those stories out. So as a traditionalist principal, I, I always feel like I've been a student relationship person and I was at the at the uh, middle school for 22 years, so I, I knew my community. I got to go through a generation of kids. But then when I went to Lincoln, it was, it was the most out of control environment I'd ever seen. I, I mean, my jaw was stuck to my chest when I went over for just for a two day visit where they had removed the principal and put a brand new internship in, the, it's called pain, the school is called pain, send your kids to pain, your most hurting, struggling kids, send them to pain, uh, or that's those pain kids. So that reputation was there. And so when, when I felt it was safe enough that I could leave the school, which was the third year, I, I went to Terry Barilla, our community coordinator on ACES invited me to Spokane and I heard John Medina as a keynote. Uh, I can't pronounce his exact title, but, he, but he's world known in, in the brain sciences. But I had never heard about toxic stress before until Dr. Medina introduced it. I didn't know that if you're heavily under toxic stress that that releases a chemical in your brain called cortisol that impairs your ability to learn and it impairs your ability to problem solve. I had never heard about that. Fight, flight, freeze, you know, I'd hear it a little bit, so, connected to something else. But when Dr. Medina came up and shared that and started going through that, this range, and then said it's physiologically uh, impossible for these kids to take in new knowledge when their brains are in the fight, flight, freeze mode. 
And in our traditional value, if, if a kid comes in or we're interacting with a student or even a parent, it's usually we're leading the discussion and we're leading it to where we want it to go. I, I just had communication with a principal from Wisconsin that I've been working with who we, we got to work on some things because it's like you you will have a, a consequence. I mean, big ball. Everything's about rewards and consequences. Where again, coming back to a a trauma informed approach, I always say the trauma informed is the umbrella that makes everything else that you do better. And I, as educators, we never say kids can't, but there are kids that can't physiologically function when they're in that level. And we never say it's out of control. It's always the student's choice to act the way they do. My God, we've got fifth graders coming in our buildings, and some of our teachers are saying, he did it to me. And I'm thinking, at five years old, he got up in the morning, barely got himself dressed, and said, I'm gonna get Mrs. Smith today. That's my plan. But we are treating kids as such, that they are doing it to us, and then we're doing it back with the hammer, and it doesn't go a long ways. I, I wanted to show you, I want to show you this slide with the little girl underneath the table. I've been in four different schools in which the office has been called to come down and get this defiant child out from underneath the table. And when we were able to get, these are young, these were, were for, uh, fifth, first and uh, second graders. When we were able, strangers, Brooke, uh, who, who works, who you'll see in the movie today, incredible intervention specialist. She, just had, she got on the floor with these kids, they never met her, making sure they were feeling safe, and she was able to get them out from the table, and then they would go down to the intervention office, their specialist's office, and, and talk about it. Every single kid. 100%, I know it's only four, 100% when they were asked, why were you under the table? It's, they said, because I'm stupid. So we're making these judgments sometimes when these kids come in and we're not seeking the story behind the behavior. Because when they were told to do it at their desk and, it, and learning, and if I'm not feeling safe in my learning because I'm stupid and you keep forcing me to do something that's making me look stupid in my eyes then I flight and that's why so many kids are under the table and then we, we reinforce their feelings about themselves when we get them out get them out of here and we reinforce it when they return to our class that we look at up and go, oh my God, the principal sent you back and just shake our heads. These kids know body language like nobody else. They have to, if they're gonna survive their home environment, they have to have a survival brain because they don't know if dad's a happy drunk or if he's a mean drunk. They need to know when it's time to flight uh, for their safety. And that's something that, that, that was very shocking. We had one school that we went into that we're doing expansion work. Uh, little boy, actually, the teacher had one arm, one leg, walked him down a long hallway, came into the intervention specialist room, said, you can have him. What's wrong? I don't know. He's just throwing a fit. He wants to call his mom, so he's trying to be manipulative. This little guy was asking to call mom, because dad is in prison for breaking his face with a baseball bat 
and watching his mom getting beat with a bat, why wouldn't we let a student just call home and say, Mom, are you okay? And take that stress off that child's brain so then now he can put that towards learning versus that going around, is, is mom okay, is mom okay, is mom okay? And that's what interrupts the thinking. The window of tolerance uh, is one of the most powerful graphics for me. Um, when you look at the healthy family and those two beautiful granddaughters of mine, when you look at the healthy family, they're prepared. They can walk into the schools, They've, they're already, have been reading, they know their colors, they stay in between the lines, I still can't. Um, but if you look at the bottom baseline of tolerance, the red's not showing up, but they have all that area to work in before they hit their breaking point. And again, that's the children that we're having them lay out the standards. That's, we want kids to be like that. They can figure the cause and effect. They'll go for the reward. And they know that they've got to work towards the reward and they'll do what they have to do to get the reward. But when we look at the trauma impact brain, they, they have a very low tolerance before they hit their breaking point. And when they hit that breaking point is when you get that explosion. Now John L, who gave me permission to show this, when she first transferred to Lincoln, one of our practices was is that we were out meeting kids at the steps as they were coming on campus and, and watching them because kids could come by and you could tell they were really upset and then we'd make a mental note and follow up on it uh, later in the morning. But Johnelle, when she first came in, she'd come up the stairs, good morning, let's get about it. Good morning, Janelle. You better tell Sheila to shut her mouth up or I'm going to put my fist in it. We had to bring her down on that one and have a little talk about it. But the anger coming out of this, this gal every day. Uh, we could have suspended her every day just by what she said coming up the stairs. But we kept bringing her in. What's up? What's wrong? What's causing your anger? And for Johnell, we've been able, or we're able to take her baseline tolerance because of what she learned, and now she has a much greater gap. We can't always take them down to where those healthier kids that come in, but we sure as heck can bring our high-risk kid students' window of tolerance down so that they have more room to work in. And, uh, Donnell, I bought her a longboard because she would longboard around town till 10 or so until she knew her parents would be passed out drunk and then she would feel safe to go into the house. Just want to go over this with you. This is the belief of the children that are coming in and everything I'm sharing with you is evidence-based. Research. I, I don't know where we got off that track to all of a sudden we were taking on all these mandates that have no research behind it. So what I'm sharing with you today is all uh, backed by research. But these kids that come in that, I, that are isolated, they isolate because they're not feeling lovable. Search out, especially as administrators, I, I feel like we have to be very visible. And I always found that, whether it was at my middle school or when I went to Lincoln, if you're out there greeting kids, you're building relationships, I think you gotta be out there at every lunch. I know it's hard, because when you're at lunch, stuff starts stacking. But that's the relationship time, to move. Look for the isolated kids. Just acknowledge that they're there. Good morning, it's good to have you. You probably won't have to get a reaction. But over time, they become your shadow and then you wish they would isolate a little bit. 
when they are emotionally neglected, then they feel like they're worthless. And I, I mean, I'm a high school guy, but I'm working in a lot of elementaries. Don't, uh, I don't claim to be an expert in any way, but these little guys coming into elementary are able to articulate themselves pretty darn well. And the emotional neglect and that sense of worthlessness, that I'm stupid, abandonment, uh, on this, this one here, we didn't graduate Dylan. Dylan got on meth, and we did everything we could to get him back. We weren't able to. Dylan got off of meth outside of Lincoln. He's got his support in place. We helped him with employment. He's working with the Walla Walla School District as a as a sub, hoping to get on with their custodial staff. And if you talk to him, even though he felt loved when he was a student, he felt very ashamed that he allowed himself to go into that kind of an addiction, but he made it back. And who do you want to know that he made it back? His teachers. He made a special trip to say, I'm off meth. And then when we look at academic performance, this is a hot button for me. I don't think you can be working any harder than you're working. I think our teachers are under tremendous stress. I see it all the time. Uh, when I go out to the principals to see them, we don't always get to the trauma because I feel like I'm a therapist. I just have to listen. And tears are coming down. The, the man, I know the mandates are very stressful. But the kid that comes into our academic environment, they're coming in with that fight because every kid impacted by trauma, it's a safety issue. And they will fight you on it if they don't feel safe with it. It looks like defiance, but it's a safety issue. Simply by having a person sit down and say, this looks hard for you. Do you mind if I help you with this? Or if you had a paraeducator. Or so, to let that child know, hey, it's safe. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this together. We're going to make it. Our kids will avoid shame at any cost because they will not be embarrassed in front of their peers. The defiance part under the table comes from survival. And then consequences. You can give them consequences. You do. I did. I could tell you which kid had what was leading the building at 21 referrals when I was tracking that. And, but they'll accept the consequences if they're being shamed in front of their peers. And lastly, they feel labeled. And that's where I would hear that at the high school where they were kicked out from the traditional and sent to the alternative, is that I, I, don't, I don't belong in school. People think I'm dumb, I got kicked out. And I said, well, we would meet as a team with our new kids coming in and say, we guarantee you here, you're gonna be valued and cared for. This young man, brilliant. He, go, he could pick his college. Lost him to meth. Now, I'm sure a lot of your communities are like, Walla Walla, we've been hit with, with meth and heroin very hard. And he gets out of jail and he comes by and wants to talk to me and he says, can you give me another chance? And I said, heck yeah. Your family. He goes, well, I'm going to beat it this time. It's going to be easy. I said, well, it's not going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of work, and you're going to have to really stay connected with your support. He never even made it after that meeting to his brother's house. He was back at the meth house. 
off math, and he graduated this last uh, June. Came back and got his diploma. And when I talk about fear, this young man was the, was the kid that would greet me in the morning. He would ask me how I'm doing before I could ask him how he was doing. And every lunch, he would come by and say, so how's your day going? Incredibly young, uh, young man. All kinds of talent. Struggles in math. He came by one day and he slipped his head in the office and said, can I talk to you? I said, sure, come in. And before I shut the door, I knew in my head that he was coming in because both of his parents had fallen back into addiction. He was eating out, he, he was eating out of a can, vegetables. The house was a mess. So I shut the door and I turn around and his, his tears streaming. I said, Brian, what's up? And I'm expecting to hear about his parents. And he said, spoiler, I am such a dumbass. I said, what? He goes, I'm a dumbass. I said, Brian, why would you, what, why are you calling yourself that? He says, well, in the, te in the math class I'm in, the teacher puts out every step to working through a fraction. It's right there, and I don't get it. That particular teacher was one of the ones that I had to work with, would write him up because he was refusing to do his work. Never took the time to say, Brian, what's up? What can we do to make you feel safe? What can we do to help you with your math so that you will feel comfortable and quit skipping math? You know, when we look at the cycle of how these kids go through our system, the first thing we look at, what happens, is that attendance starts to uh, fall off. Unless we have home visitors and really go after that, then we're losing kids. And if they have the poor attendance, then they're struggling academically because they're not there to learn, then they become dis engaged and then what do we see we start seeing that disruptive behavior and then the student has a loss of hope he they cannot connect two weeks down they're trying to connect on a daily basis where, where am I going to sleep tonight all kinds of things that are rolling in their heads And then and they drop out on us. I had one student that started Lincoln, 18 years old with three credits. So we sat down. I said, I said Jerry, you, you're not going to want to go to school until you're 25, do you? He goes, Hell no. I said, Let, Let's see if we can get, if you'll trust us, we'll get you through the GED process. That's when GED counted for something and he gave it he gave us a shot but after uh, four weeks he came by my office and said um, I didn't just want to walk out the door I wanted to stop by and say I can tell the teachers here really care about kids I mean, he goes I've never experienced that and I want you to know that I've experienced it in your school and I want to thank you for tr trying to help me out but I'm dropping out of school. And I said, oh, you can't drop out. Trust us. And he says, Spoiler, I do trust you. I do trust the teachers. I don't know where I'm staying tonight. I don't know where I'm going to get a meal tonight. And that's all I can think of when I'm at school. I'm not a high stakes test fan because of all these mandates that are coming down. 
and the ones that are getting killed are our trauma kids and the kids whose brains have been hardwired differently we're putting them all on the same measurement scale and it reminds me of this cartoon you know we want to be fair so go climb the tree that's how our assessments sometimes are coming across at least in my state they are so if you look at Maslow over over 60 years ago if you even look at Maslow's chart you have to go up the steps to get the academic learning if you're hungry if you're in an unsafe environment you cannot get to learning unless you hit those steps and yet we're being judged you're being judged on the learning we've had a one we've had lots of good emotional social and emotional programs in our buildings that we what we've had to toss them because we got to get the academic learning we're being judged we're being graded but Maslow even shows us if we are not meeting those basic needs you cannot get the academic learning and when you're working your tail end off so and you and you get a small just a small increase it comes with a huge heavy cost of labor on your end and on your teachers end and pressure because somebody's judging you but if, if we look at this again we can get what it is that we want if we change our approach so Lincoln High School um, I was at the middle school for 22 years and uh, had a gentleman come by and see me and I thought it was a salesman so I told my secretary get me get him out of the, my office 10 minutes max well, it was, a, it was a consultant that the district had hired to assess all of our district alternative programs. I didn't know they were doing it, and there was no reason for him to come to my school even to share it. So I can't explain that. But I read the report. And he put a voice to every one of the people that he interviewed. And he put a voice to the Lincoln kids, he put a voice to the community as a school of wasted tax dollars. All they're doing is babysitting over there. Who would want to put money in that building for those kids? We don't feel safe here, it's teachers, staff. Why can't we have a cook? They got a bat sack lunch every day same thing a hamburger dried up old hamburger the bottom all the bottom windows were barred looked like a dang juvenile facility lockup facility so to make a culture and especially going into one that's out of control and trying to get control of it because the history was F you if I showed up to class and I put my feet on the desk I'm told to re take them down F you you can't leave the class F you you need to take your headphones off F you with that you can tell I, I didn't have a very good welcoming committee when I went over because it was so bad when I went over for the two-day visit that I actually asked to be transferred immediately because I only had I only had a short time I felt to try to get some things turned around and when I walked into that building I'm a high-five guy and a fist bump guy and I was high-fiving myself and I was fist bumping myself and I was having conversations by myself because I went in and sat next to the kids they would act as if I wasn't there and if I said good morning I, never, I wouldn't get a response back so I had to deal with a lot of rejection and I was the guy 
in their eyes that was going to come in and make pain at the time <clears throat> to look like the traditional high school when they'd been hurt. So when we went to, when I went over there, I knew we had to change the name. I've lived in the community for over 30 years. The kids chose the new name. That helped us with the new culture. And that helped us to bring the kids in. I call it student meetings. I couldn't call it assemblies because we weren't capable of an assembly because of our behavior. But at these meetings is where we would talk. And I would, and thank God for Dan and his interviews because he saved my bacon so many times when they wanted to complain about something, I would just simply say, I'm your advocate. We got the cook by the end of the year. We had a co-ed soccer team, we got two matches in. They had their first prom. A Xeroxed handbook that you thought you gave them a brick of gold so with the culture changes that started, and I was still in my traditional mold, I had to deal with the F-offs, but we, we, after John Medina, I mean, he, he hit me like a lightning bolt. But our paradigm shift came that we did need a new approach. I was always told, you put them out, they're going to have a free day. And my response was that, I'm not their parent. I can't tell you what kind of day they're going to have, but the kids in the building are going to see what I, that that's unacceptable behavior. So that, and I used to give the life lessons about if you say this to your boss, you're going to get fired and can't use that language here at school. So I thought I gave them great life lessons. But with this new approach, what we found out is that the barriers that were in these young people's lives became stepping stones. And here's the hope in this whole process and that, that builds resilience. It got us reconnected with, with the kids I showed you that are out of school. They still are in the family. And that's the message we send. We are a family. They still check up with their teachers once they're gone. They come flying back when they left us sick and we were sick of what was gonna to happen to them. They fly back to show the family that they've made changes because they're so proud of it. But with a caring adult relationship changes the life path. A caring adult relationship with these kids, all kids, can change a life path. And then when you change that life path, that's when they start to find the hope. And when they get a hold of hope, you get out of their way, because they're moving. Self-confidence. And then we taught our kids, you gotta have a village of support. You've got to put some people in your life that will cover your back, be there for you. It's not the one that's going to say, let's go smoke a bowl. But you've got to keep those caring adults in your life so that you can call on them when you need them. And that's, a, that's part of the culture that we were able to build in. And by the way, I'm, a, I'm the guy up here speaking if I had my choice, I'd have my whole staff up here because what they did on a day-to-day -day basis blew me away. And so it's a team effort. It's not a one-person one show. So in our shift, we went, we went from what's wrong with this student to what has this student gone through. This little gal came in as a freshman, a little bit of a poop. And then she moved out, moved to Spokane, and then we got reconnected and she drove down and my wife and I took her out to dinner and she was on track to graduate. She was in a program that she was moving so rapidly. She was gonna make her graduation date. My wife and I said, we're gonna be there. And she crashed. 
moved back to Walla Walla, looked up her family, her Lincoln family. She's got her own place. She, she went out and got her own job. And now she's ready to start looking at how we can get her connected to the community college. So all kids with trauma and ACEs, you don't always see it right away, the change. It can come later. Some the transformation just happens right before your eyes and they just keep going. When, when, when Jade was a freshman, I'll never forget, it was Halloween day, and as you know, if we want to get anything done, we have to work weekends or get to school very, very early. And this was one of those mornings I had gotten to school very, very early and just got settled in to get through my pile of work, and Jade is at my doorstep at 6.30 in the morning with Kyleen, her best friend. Jade's cute as a bug's there. She's all dressed up like a bunny. Her friend, Kyleen, has her costume in her arm, and then there's a little guy there. And Jay goes, Sproder, my little brother's going to be with me today. I said, well, Jay, that can't happen. It's a liability issue. I'd do it if I could, but it can't. she goes, Sproder, he, he's staying with me. I said, Jade, I'd love to make that happen. She goes, can we sit down and talk? So they come in, and she looks at, just looks at me and says, there might be a dead man in our apartment. I said, what? Well, the person they're staying, that she was staying with got high on meth and told them all to get out, and he started barricading the doors and the windows, and he was going to... Have it, out, have it out with the police. And then while we're, she's sharing this with me, her phone rings, and then she kind of gets into it with her mom and puts the phone down and says, yeah, she's on, she's on the run. There's a warrant out for her. She's the one that my secretary came in livid because Jade hit the wrong button for the pictures that she wanted printed, and it came into the office all color, almost a half a ream, third of a ream of paper. And my secretary was just so upset about that. So I called Jade in. I said, Jade, we can't use our printers as our for photographs. And tears started coming down her face. And she says, Sporleader. I thought they were gang at first because they were so tatted up. But then I, I saw this. Nice woman in the middle, and I got a little confused at some of the pictures. But uh, she says that's the first time my mom's had all of her kids. My grandmother has had all of her kids together. Nobody's in prison now. So I let my secretary cool off, and then I gave her all her pictures back. So. So with our kids, when we have them in our office, we've got the healing starts with them and the relationship starts when, the, when they know that their voice has been heard. We've, we don't have to validate the action. Validate the voice. Ask them the questions rather than being the, the, uh, the giver. I want to tell you what's going to happen. When students are allowed to express their feelings, that's when change begins to happen. And it's the platform for us as educators to start building those relationships. I, the conferences I had in the office are burned into my memory, the powerful conferences, because we talked about what was going on, but we also held them accountable. And my, my first uh, student that came in that told the teacher to F off, and I had made the decision that I was going to keep the discipline inside, I was sick to my stomach. I was literally nauseous, because that was a three-day out-of-school suspension if you told the teacher to F off. And when the kid comes in, 
all I said was, Jared, what's going on? Doesn't sound like you. And it just, that's all I said. I didn't give him my lecture, you know, and we had fire and all that. Just said, what's going on? Didn't sound like you. And he just broke down and said, my dad's a drunk, spoiler leader. He's failed me my entire life and I am so pissed off. I don't have to validate what he said to the teacher, but I can sure validate that must really hurt. I'm, that makes me feel bad. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. And he goes, he, he's, let me on, he's let me down on everything. But today I'm 16 and he promised me a car. And I didn't, there's no car. I am so pissed. He's, he set me up. Normally I don't let him set me up, but I thought he was going to come through. And he didn't. And as Jared's talking to me, his level is, even though he's pissed, is coming down. And I'm just sitting at the table listening and validating the voice. And he says, thank you, Sproyer, for listening. You're welcome. And this is what happens so often. More than not is the first thing he says, that teacher didn't deserve that. I need to apologize. And I said, that, that would be very noble, but I, I never make kids apologize. I want it to come from their heart. He goes, I, I, I need to apologize. Then I brought up the consequence. I'm not going to keep you out of school, Jared. We're going to do the discipline in school. He was fine. It was okay. He knew what he, he knew what he did was wrong. And when he went out to, after school, he went out to talk to the teacher with the apology. And the teacher comes in and says, oh my gosh, I can't believe the apology that Jared gave me. And he shared with me what was going on. He goes, wow, he's dealing with a lot. Now, in my first year of making this transition of, from out of school to in school, I have to tell you that kids weren't used to being in school suspension. They were used to being in out of school. So I had many that wanted to barter with me and say, don't put me in ISS, just suspend me. I said, well, I'm, I'm not suspending you. I'm putting you in, it, in, in school suspension. I don't want to be in in-school suspension. Why? It's boring. All right, he's, he's taking my stomach ache away. He's reinforcing. I had kids in that year that were begging me to suspend them because they didn't want to do lunch detention. Because when we put them, literally, when we do put them out on the street, there's no supervision. We don't know if they're in a healthy situation or not. We don't know who they're hanging with. Are they breaking into homes? But when you keep it inside and, and start developing that nurturing relationship, that was, that was the only year I, ha I had kids begging me to suspend them. From then on, kids appreciated it. The one part about trauma-informed is we can't get our, that lens and say, oh, it's those kids. Because if you try to assess who's trauma, who isn't, you're gonna, you're gonna the, the one that's not trauma is the one you wanna pound the flesh out of. He's the manipulator. If, the strongest part about a trauma-informed model is not only developing the caring adult relationships and you being the go-to person and you having that type of impact on a person's life, is that you have to have accountability. It can look differently, but you have to have accountability. That, to me, is what makes it such a powerful model. How much time do I have? I always joke that Jamie came to town to film a movie, but he left, his whole crew and himself left in tears because they left Walla Walla uh, leaving behind relationships.
and he, he'll be the first to tell you that this, is a, this was one of the few projects that he has done that he, he still calls all the kids that are in the film and checks up on them. And that man is busy. But from traditional to, to trauma-informed, I just want to give you a quick story on Stephen, who's in, who's in the movie, or film, is that he was in class flicking the lighter. Teacher asked for it, wouldn't give it to him. One of my best teachers at de-escalating kids, he just kept going up, up, up. So he brought him up to me and said, boss, I've tried, he's yours. I said, Stephen, what's up? He wants my F and lighter. Well, I said, well, hand me the lighter and go back to class. He goes, you're not getting my F and lighter. I said, Stephen, make it simple. Hand me the lighter and go back to class. And then he got real intense. You're not I mean, screaming. And so then, at the convincing part, I opened up my drawer and there's like 45 different color lighters. And I said, Stephen, I gotta do with you what I've done for the other 45. And he just lost it. I mean, I, I, over the table, giving me the finger right in my face, telling me to do things that aren't very nice. And then as he left my office, I have a, had a big window. He turned around and gave me the message the second time. I have hard hearing, I'm hard, so he wanted to make sure I got the message the second time. And so I followed him. I, I knew he was leaving campus, but I just wanted to be out there. I kept, I kept my distance. But he stops at the gate and turns around and does it again. Same message. And so I got back to the office. My receptionist goes, ay, ay, ay. I said, what, are you jealous? She goes, what? I said, who's told you you're number one three times in a row? <laughs> you know, I, I, but in my traditional mold with Stephen, I was suspending, he got suspended a lot. And then he and his dad and I would do this. But with Stephen, I called dad, told dad what had happened, and I said, I want you and Stephen here tomorrow morning. And they showed up because a piece of information that came to me because my staff was so, they're so co cohesive was, Stephen went by his mom's home in the morning. He lived with his dad, and the there was nothing in it. She moved. It's up and moved. He was worried sick. He didn't know where she was at. She, she, he didn't know if she was safe. He was sick. Why didn't he want to give up his lighters? The only thing he had control of that day. And so when I brought him in, I told I because we have to teach our kids and, and, and the adults, if we're going to say that we love you unconditionally, then we need to explain to them what it's about. We need to tell them, you know, what happened yesterday, that's history. I'm, I feel really bad that you had to experience what you did in, yesterday before school. And tears just started coming down his eyes. And when I sent him up to the in-school suspension, he was able to process with the in-school suspension teacher and share what happened. That's the type of community you want to start building where others will say, well, then everybody's going to want to go up and visit with the ISS coordinator. No, they don't. I gave my teachers the opportunity that if a kid needed to go up for a timeout until they were ready to re-enter, it was okay. But if you share that, oh, you, you give them, they get to call their timeouts, everybody's going to be calling the timeout. Doesn't happen. A few times it happens if it's math every day, and then you have to deal with it and talk to them. But with Stephen, if I, in my traditional mold, five days out, and I would have let him know very clearly, you will never speak to me like that, in my traditional mold. You will never disrupt the office like that again. To where, when I went to trauma-informed, connected with him, valued his voice, valued his pain, and kept him in school. 
That was the safest place for him. So, and it just got, he just kept growing from being in my office a lot to hardly ever being sent down. And though that's the transformations when you see him. It's the motivator to just to keep learning more and more about this. Those are two of my Lincoln teachers. They're just incredible the way they take care of kids. Both of them took kids to college. Both of them paid for all their gear for, the, for their rooms and set up visitations. This is a tool I use. I know it looks goofy, but if you have it in your office and it's laying on your desk, ask, you have to teach what each ring is. Green, I'm doing great, feel great. Yellow, I'm feeling some stress. Red, I'm blowing up. And so I would use that as my talking piece when kids would come in. Where, where's your anger at right now? And then after a while, they just came in and would, <laughs> I mean, they'd point where they were at. Red, they can't learn. They're in the fight flight. They can't problem solve. So instead of escalating them, you will talk to me now. It's, I can see you need some time to come down. So we gave our kids that time. It only usually takes 10 minutes, and then we bring them in. And that's where you teach, hey, you know what? You're going to feel stress here. You're not going to go from red to green. But the stress in the yellow ring allows you to learn and stay engaged. If you feel like you're, you're, you're going back to the red, get a hold of me. Or your teacher will provide an option for you to get it settle down. We, kept, we had kids coming in on the ceiling that when they had a chance to de-escalate, we were able to engage them in the class. These are just some uh, options that we use. We use timeout. I let my teachers decide if a student needed to go to timeout. A lot of times the teachers would pull the student out and just say, I'm trying to teach. What's going on? You're kind of keeping me from teaching. Well, I'm having a bad day. Do you need to go see Shelly? Or I don't care if you come in and put your head down. Just let me teach. Those types of exchanges build relationships. So we went with in school. Actually, I, I did open the campus up. And lunch detention was the number one thing they hated the most. So a lunch detention. <laughs> ended up being more powerful than a full day of ISS. But you have to, if, if, if we're, if we're going to do this, I'm going to throw in the accountability piece. You've got to hold kids accountable. If we don't, we're, 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 we're uh, failing them. And then, obviously, there are times when you do have to suspend or if there's a legal issue that needs to be dealt, dealt with. I want, I want to just go through the data. And there's a research report that just came out. It's been out for about five months. And it's actually sweeping the nation. And it's Dario Longhai, he's a nationally known uh, research statistician. He's the only one in the country that has been able to put an A score with a resilience score. And I'll share with you his findings. This is just shows you the number of office referrals. When I started, uh, I used the year before I put in the uh, trauma-informed model. We had as, as many as 993 referrals earlier. But this is when I started keeping the, da the data baseline. But if you notice, at 320 referrals, our kids average 3.5 aces. 280 referrals, it drops, our kids average 4.5. 2012-13, it drops again, and our kids are averaging 5.5 aces. And, and yet, we're seeing less and less with the discipline. 
I don't like to show this slide, but when I did my baseline, I had put kids out about 800 days out of the year with my wonderful life lessons BS story. The suspensions dropped, and if you'll keep in mind that 3.5, 4.5, 5.5, how that can still continued to drop. I'm telling you, a 5.5 kid, you, you, your work, it's hard work, because you're doing a lot of, you're being proactive, which is preventing a lot of things from happening. When I first went to Payne, one of my first visitors there was the chief of police, and he says, hey, Jim, what, what about an SRO in your building? I didn't kiss him, I just felt like it. He goes, we have so many calls coming to, your, to Payne that it would pay for me to put an SRO in, in the building. So we, we got an SRO. This is, this is a data with an SRO. But look how it dropped once we changed. And our SRO was promoted to a sergeant position. And his letter to the staff was, he goes, I'm going back out into the field a different person than when I came in watching how you interact. He had an incredible relationship with the kids. But his empathy, as he is now out working in the community and law enforcement, his empathy came from his experience. There's a couple more. Here's, the, here's where we look at the gray. Our high school is one of the top high schools in the state, and we were only behind uh, four to six percentage points in reading and writing. And we were the easy school. So I hope you're seeing through just some of this data that we can get what we want if we just change our approach. The graduation rate, I got, the state nailed me on graduation rates. I went to this meeting with hundred and some people, teams from all these schools that were school of focuses. And they put me on there for graduation rates. I couldn't help it. I challenged the guy, because he asked, does anybody have any questions? And I said, yeah, why am I here? I said, you got me here on graduation rates. I'm an alternative school. 85% of my kids come in credit deficient. My mission is to get them graduated. Why am I on this list? Uh, I said, Washington State did a study that came out that alternative ed shouldn't be on a grading list. Uh, well, some of them had 18% graduation rates, and so we didn't feel like we should let anybody off the hook. We had more conversations on that, but Lincoln, uh, for 2015, we don't have the figures out yet, but I hear it's, got, it's gonna go higher and it was one of only two schools in the state to have increased by 75%. So finish on this. So this is a young man. He's 25 now, but he came to us as a freshman. And every time I see him, we have breakfast or lunch. The guy's got wisdom like I've, I've never seen contentment, happiness, peacefulness. He said, uh, before coming to Lincoln, this is the last time we met, I, I about fell out. He goes, yeah, I, I don't know if I told you this. He calls me Jim now. He says, I, I was gonna take my life before coming to Lincoln. I said, you got, Ethan, you've never told me that story. He goes, no, I had a plan, I had a plan. And if Lincoln didn't work, then I, I was gonna carry it out. And I said, well, what made the change? He says, when I gave Lincoln a chance, I came and you loved me. And this is a kid that was kicked out of other schools. If we love our kids, and I think we're compassionate people, 
we love our kids and we just change our approach to break away from that traditional. Ethan's at the base of the Himalayas with his grandmother's ashes. He walked all 2,600 miles of the Pacific Trail. Over in Tibet, he met some monks, went and lived in a village for a month and taught English. The kid is absolutely amazing. It's going to take his life. I took too long, so, but I'll be around if you have any questions and uh, be glad to meet you. And again, I appreciate what you do. I know, I know it's tough. Oh.